-hmm. I often say that the urban monoculture loves the LGBT community in the same way Hamas loves hospitals. It sets up the most imperious elements of its operation in the hearts of vulnerable communities to divert attacks against it to those communities, allowing it to claim the moral high ground. This can be seen in its tendency to use the rainbow flag to show conquest over institutions. After a mosque, synagogue, etc., has been conquered, they will hang this out front to direct anger away from the culprit of the cultural erasure and towards the LGBT community. Now, if you have fallen victim to their propaganda, you might be saying, oh, but what's the difference? I mean, the vast majority of gay people are progressives, right? 45% of gay men in the last election cycle voted for Donald Trump. People are like, no, it needs to redirect the anger at the LGBT community. It needs that the LGBT community of its loudest voices. And it's like, no, it doesn't. It controls our media. It controls our school system. It could use powerful people to, to be the scapegoats, but it doesn't. It uses the vulnerable members of its community to be the scapegoats, to be the, the, the biggest proponents of the most imperious aspects of the culture and the loudest proponents. You know, when you go on TikTok and you see the craziest ultra progressive viewpoints, they are people in these communities. Would you like to know more? The stage at which I can't feel my fingertips anymore. I love that you, and you're the one who enforces this on the family, to be clear. I always say that you can indulge yourself when you want. I'm not enforcing this on the children. They say repeatedly, I love the cold. They prefer the cold. You are an amazing woman, Simone. And I appreciate how austerely you live because it helps us stay focused on what matters, which is moving things forward for our species during this particular time of challenges that we live in. And one of the biggest challenges has really made clear to me when we were talking to a reporter recently, and they were asking for more clarification on the urban monoculture, right? Mm. And it made me realize that one of the mistakes that people can make when dealing with the urban monoculture is to think that it has the similarities it has because it is true. But that is not the case. Mm -hmm. And so I'm actually going to start by reading my response to the reporter about the urban monoculture. Um, Dive right in, friend. While the urban monoculture is not the sole cause of demographic collapse, no realistic solution to demographic collapse is possible without addressing the issues posed by the urban monoculture. The fertility rates within all cultural groups are crashing, but the proximity of a group to the urban monoculture is directly correlated to the speed of the crash. Worse, cultural innovation any family attempts will be fought by the urban monoculture insofar as it deviates from the urban monoculture, which, is defini which it definitionally will due to the monoculture's low fertility rate. The urban monoculture is the dominant cultural group in the world today and one of the descendants of European imperialism. It is what many call wokeness, progressiveness, etc. It sees itself as naturally superior to all other cultural groups and perspectives, seeing them as essentially backward savages, and its imperative is to spread over all of the world's population. What makes it hazardous is the urban monoculture has the lowest fertility rate of any cultural group in the world. As such, it only survives by parasitizing children from nearby demographically healthy cultural groups. Usually, these are conservative religious groups or importing families from geographically distant cultures and converting their children. Children. This creates an existential problem in our society that I predict will be the core source of conflict over the next century. The dominant cultural group, the group that controls the school system and mass media, must attempt to convert children from neighboring cultures to keep its population numbers stable. Conversion targets of the urban monoculture naturally see the industrial conversion of their children as a threat. There are high fertility groups in every country, but they are all quote unquote weird, where weirdness is defined by cultural distance from the dominant cultural group in society the urban monoculture. These groups look like weird secular religions like our family has, ultra-Orthodox Jews, quiverfuls, tradcasts, etc. The problem is, even if the urban monoculture wanted to stop its industrial conversion system, it couldn't. If it did, its population would quickly collapse and it would lose the political and bureaucratic power it is used to subjugate its neighbors, who are at this point very angry. It has proverbially caught the tiger by the tail. The longer it holds the tiger, the angrier the tiger gets, but if it lets go, things will get bloody. Political parties around the world are beginning to drift into two factions, one representing the urban monoculture and its goal of cultural genocide, and the other representing a diverse alliance of those attempting intergenerational preservation of their cultural identity. 
As to what the urban monoculture is, it can be hard to explain because once one converts, unlike other cultures, it does not demand they identify as a member. They just have to adopt its perspectives, values, practices, morality, ideology, and cosmology. To understand this in practice, ask an ultra-progressive Jew, Muslim, Catholic, feminist, etc. what their views are on gender, relationships, the nature of the universe, morality, sexuality, marriage, our relation to the environment, etc., and you will get nearly identical answers. Were you to pose the same question to a conservative Jew, Muslim, Catholic, feminist, you would get wildly different answers to each question. I would also note here that the convergent position of the urban monoculture is not due to quote-unquote science, as is will regularly ignore science when it conflicts with the culture's canon just as quickly and aggressively as religious extremists do. Now, I'm not going to go further here because it was actually this last point that I really want to expand upon. Many people, when they look at the convergent beliefs that you have among progressive Catholics or progressive Jews or progressive Muslims, they say these convergent beliefs are just science, right? And it very clearly is not true. It's not true in the field of genetics. It's not true in the field of demography. And, and I wanted to pull up a few instances of this that we've seen recently. So mm -hmm. one I wanted to share with you is this insane graph that about 70% of liberal 12th grade girls believe women are discriminated against in getting a college education, it's despite insane. the fact that women attain more bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees than men. There are literally 11 times, so 11,000% more women's only scholarship than men's only scholarships in the U.S., the level of distortion to reality you have to have to believe this. When you also just look at rates of college graduation and attendance, male to female, there is an obvious skew. Yeah. Well, and, and it's something we see with demographic stuff. You know, we'll talk with reporters about demographic stuff and they'll say demographers say this isn't an issue. You cannot predict this stuff long term. I'm like, but you, you literally can. I can ask the younger generation how many kids they plan to have. I can look at trailing indicators like rates of religiosity. I can look at every aspect of data we have, and it says it's going to get worse over time. I can look at countries that are further ahead of us and collapse. So they have this distortion field that is not science. And it's very important that we call it out as not science or not mm -hmm. just what is culturally just. So is it just to lie to people? Like, is it culturally just? But this, this is a huge problem, right? Is they're like, we are not erasing these cultures. You know, when a culture becomes sufficiently progressive, it hasn't been erased, even though they all fly the same flag now, you know, which we'll talk about in a second. You know, I go to an ultra progressive mosque and I go to an ultra progressive church and I go to an ultra progressive synagogue. They'll have the same flag in front of every one of these churches. You know, they, 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 they're like, oh, well, that's just an interesting coincidence. You know, they, they are trying to protect a, a vulnerable group. And I'm like, well, there's lots of vulnerable groups in society. Why are they all converging around the same vulnerable group in terms of the flags that they're flying? Which goes to something that I often say, which is uh, the urban monoculture loves the LGBT community in the same way Hamas loves hospitals, which is to say they are using this community in a community that is in some ways genuinely vulnerable to redirect anger that would otherwise be pointed at the larger problem, which is the urban monoculture, towards a discriminated subgroup. And then they use that misdirection and the danger that they cause to individuals of that subgroup through their um, blatant proselytization and attempts to deconvert children using our education system and mass media to anger against this one specific subset of the population, which to be honest, I don't even know, like do most gay men even still support Democrats? I, I could look this up. Well, I'll look it up after and edit in, the, in editing. Ha <laughs> ha, I called it. 45% of gay men in the last election cycle voted for Trump over Biden and 51% voted for Biden. So it's basically half and half about now, and I suspect it's going to flip in the next election cycle or the one after that. But yeah. I think they, I think they do, pretty overwhelmingly. Then there's just like the Lincoln Republicans and that's it. Just to clarify, it turns out her intuition was wrong and that it's about half and half right now and likely moving towards majority Republican in the next cycle. 
And I also remind our audience of this, any of you who are right-leaning and maybe underestimate just how much the gay community votes Republican or how amenable they are to joining the Republican Party in mass, at least gay men. So it's it's really best to not antagonize them because they really are on our side and they are not the same in terms of these far crazy far left, you know, extremist trans activists and stuff like that. Most gay men are very similar to your average Republican. But it's 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 getting it's the the level to which they've basically been able to pull the wool over society's eyes. Yeah. Like, and as we pointed out in the studies done on, for example, like they'll take another discriminated group that they'll be like, they'll elevate to a stupid degree, to a degree that it hurts the community, like the black community. If you look at areas where Democrats have been in control for longer, the Hispanic groups and black groups have larger distances in contrasted in both earnings and scores on tests when contrasted with the white population. So the policies that are being implemented by progressives are hurting these disadvantaged communities. And this is really obvious in the data. But in, they, other word, in other words, like statistically speaking, and we're not, we're not saying necessarily there's causation, but if I were a minority in the United States, I would rather be in a Republican dominated area, a conservative area, because- Well, you will do better and your kids will do better. Yeah, exactly, exactly. With the local white population. Which is wild because you assume that of course, all you know, democratic progressive policies are meant to at first and foremost, favor and help minorities and those in need. <laughs> yeah, but I think that this is really worth drawing attention to because it, it, the illusion that what these communities are converging on when they have been infected by this mimetic virus is truth, is objectively wrong, is, is a religious extremist position that is as disconnected from science and as disconnected from reality as most small C conservative religious traditions. Now I would say that when you get to like ultra conservative religious traditions, you get a higher level of disconnection from reality. But when you're talking about, you know, a normal, I'd say conservative Christian or conservative Jew, they're probably about as disconnected from mainstream science as progressives are. Yeah, I mean, they sure. will deny when I will talk to them, I will say, well, these human traits have a genetic component to them. And they'll say, no, they don't. And I'm like, like, this isn't a new field. Like, we've been studying this for a long time. Like, yeah, they obviously do. The way a person votes, their personality has a genetic component. But it's not just the research. Like, if you know a human being with kids, you would see this. Um, and they're like, well, what about uh, adopted kids? That would be unfair. And it's like, well, if you know someone with adopted kids, you'll see that those kids are much more different from their parents than, than people without adopted kids. It's just something you can see if you look at the evidence, even anecdotal evidence within your own life. You really have to blind yourself or like never have been around a child to not realize how much of our personality and the way we act is heritable. Uh, because my kids are doing all sorts of stuff that is like me that I know I didn't teach them. Undeniable. Um, <laughs> but I also want to uh, continue here with reading what I wrote. I wanted to have a short interlude there because I didn't want it to be like a boring, just read the piece thing. <laughs> the urban monoculture parasitizes cultural movements until it becomes the dominant cultural force in them. Then it expels the members that still have adherence to the group's former ideals and culture, wearing that group's identity and history like a skin suit. It then speaks through the mouth of this marionetted corpse to claim its trials as its own. I mentioned the feminist culture because it presents an excellent case study of the phenomenon I have outlined it. As to what fighting the urban monoculture looks like, the most important thing we can do is build a school system not dedicated to cultural genocide. Mm. That is what we are doing with the Collins Institute. And I, I included a clip for her, which I'll play here. If we combine our music, she'll see that music unites all trolls and that we're all the same and that she's one of us. Poppy, I mean no disrespect, but king to queen, anything but that. Why not? I can make it right. History's just gonna keep repeating itself until we make everyone realize that we're all the same. But we're not all the same. It's why all our strings are different, because they reflect our different music. Denying our differences is denying the truth of who we are. But I'll, I'll go a bit further into like the nature of the urban monoculture because there's this one moment that really got to me when somebody said, what is wokeness to someone? And the person couldn't respond. And I was like, how stupid is that? Like, like to say, that they, of course they couldn't respond. If you say, what is a culture? That's a very difficult thing for a normal person to answer. Like if you say, what is Judaism, right? Like, 
you can you can give a few like doctrinal opinions, but like that's not really what it is as the cultural group. So so I, I wrote a quick piece on this that we can hopefully help explain to people what is the urban monoculture. Cultural groups are difficult to define and summarize. Consider you asked me to explain European imperial culture. I would say it's a culture that saw everyone outside of it as deplorable and lesser and believed it had a manifest destiny to enlighten these individuals' children and bring them up to date with the quote-unquote civilized world. Yet, this definition would apply equally to the urban monoculture it gave birth to. Were you to ask me to explain Orthodox Jewish culture, I could summarize core beliefs, important texts to the culture, and holidays, but that does not really capture the full culture. For example, Jews a thousand years ago would appear the same as Jews today if I used that explanation, but culturally they are extremely different. For that reason, I find the best way to describe a cultural group that is to... For that reason, I find the best way to describe a cultural group is to describe its evolutionary history. In the case of the urban monoculture, that is something we explore at length in the Fragmented Guide to Crafting Religion, which we would argue it is something of a mimetic supervirus that evolved out of Hicksite Quakerism. The urban monoculture's belief system is most heavily defined by the belief the goal of society is to remove as much in the moment, emotional pain is possible, and thus it is a negative utilitarian in structure. However, it has many other odd ideological structures and traditions. For example, the urban monoculture claims to love diversity, but also does not believe there are any differences between genders, cultures, ethnicities, etc. Why would diversity be a thing of value if we are all exactly the same? It really means it values diversity in its victims. So someone, I was wondering if you had any comments on this or areas on this you want to elaborate in terms of understanding it as this like, unified religious and cultural structure. Yeah, I mean, I I appreciate your highlighting it. And I think the important thing is I grew up in this culture, right? And I always remember thinking how crazy people outside of this cultural group were for not trusting the science and not believing in science. And now we live in this era where like, they are presented with peer reviewed science, like even by their own standards, you know, through, through the processes that they acknowledge are legitimate, they are denying certain truths. It is, it is really wild well, to what me. What disagrees with dogma is not science to them because yeah, it's just defined that, by they, what agrees with dogma. I can't emphasize the extent to which they wholeheartedly see what they're viewing as truth as science as as the factual basis of things and those who disagree with them as being backward uneducated bible thumping or nazi ask or racist or whatever enemies and it is the ignorance of their enemies that that makes them so evil and dangerous it is not like oh we're dealing with a smart opponent that we must you know strategize around it's never that mindset the mindset is you guys are so dumb and full of hate and you're just afraid and that but is that not the way that imperial europe saw the communities it was contacting it, it, it is a direct descendant no, of European no, imperialism. no it didn't no 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 like when you actually right, look it's at burden colonies as in colonism as in the american colonies condescension was the word that was used and it was a word that was seen as as being a noble term. Condescension was being of a, a person of culture, of education, et cetera, who, who benignly and uh, kindly condescended to those who maybe were less educated than them, but didn't like hate them for it. Um, but do you not see elements of this white man burdens mindset in this viewpoint? Oh, they no, yes, yeah, yeah, certainly in, in the progressive it. viewpoint today. Yeah. But, uh, I don't even, I don't even know. I don't well, see I mean, the, the dehumanization of the outsider is, is really core to their community. And, and you look at like where they ignore science. So the way they define science, it's like the way they define racism, like racism has become a meaningful term mm -hmm. because to be racist, if I'm like, how am I racist? I don't look down on black people and I have black friends. I engage with the black community as equals. And they're like, well, you're racist because you are not progressive in your views of race. Racism becomes defined. And this is why they'll be like, oh, this black person is a racist. You'll see like a white person saying this because they have defined racism as agreeing with the progressive stance on race and not as uh, seeing people of different ethnic groups as truly separate. And 
This is how they have begun to reinstitutionalize racial segregation in our society. You know, you look at places like California now and they have separate alert platforms for black people and Native Americans and then they have for white people. Then they have from the Amber Alert System. They have the Ebony Alert System and the Feather Alert System. God, I forgot. Now, that, and it sounds so racist. That sounds so incredibly racist. <laughs> When it is incredibly racist because they oh, are a God. racist community. Yes. When you define racism as things that disagree with the progressive team's value set, oh, then they can... don't notice when racism creeps into yeah, their it's, own it's value no holds set. Barred. It's no holds barred. It's just like fully flamboyant racism. and, and well, do, they, they are incapable of recognizing it was the definition <sighs> they have created. Oh, and right. this is the same as true around like trans stuff. If I'm like, well, puberty blockers really, like the evidence that that is not harmful is not as strong as like, I've, I've seen a lot of studies that bring up serious, serious concerns about the puberty blockers. And they're like, but it isn't science because it disagrees with what we want. <laughs> like science is defined by what they want. If a, in, and this creates a problem in outsiders trusting them because as soon as you see this and you realize that science may align with something that progressives wants, like global warming or something like that, there's really no reason to trust the data. Because even if global warming was not happening, they would be saying all of the exact same things they're saying about global warming because it gives them more state power and stuff like that. And, and it's really hard to believe that global warming is happening as a conservative when you see them, the progressives, the Green Party in Germany, shutting down the nuclear power plants with no viable alternative and just creating more carbon. One of the things that progressives often can accuse us, the pronatalists, you know, and it's true, you know, we're trying to bring the best of the best of humanity together to take to the stars, to, you know, reform this planet, to do amazing things in the future. And they're like, so you want to leave this sinking ship? Like you don't want to fix it? And I'm like, we tried. We built the nuclear power plants. Those were put up by conservatives. We Elon, for example, he built Tesla. He tried to make emissionless cars popular. He did more to making them popular than anyone else. And now you tar and feather him because he also promotes free speech? Because that is out of control. Because free speech is an existential threat to people who control information in a society. If, if, if one cultural group controls mass media and they control the school system, then of course freedom of speech is an existentially threatening idea to them because they can't have a free market of ideas where people can point out the things that we're pointing out, you know, where, where truth becomes a danger to them. Well, so, okay. If, if we're saying that this form of toxic progressivism is a virus Sorry, if we're saying that this form of toxic progressivism is a religion, does that change the tactics that people should use to defend it's themselves from it, address the, it? The analogy I use is it's a religion in the same way that contagious canine venereal cancer. So it's canines a religion, have a yeah. type of cancer that's contagious is a dog. It is a it is a parasitic cancer that evolved out of a religion, but it is not a religion. It doesn't have all of the code it needs as a cultural group to sustain itself. It absolutely can only survive through cultural parasitism. It can only survive by taking the children of other people because it lacks the, the cultural DNA that motivates reproduction and self-sacrifice, which, which I actually talk about a bit later in this piece. Not a piece, but like email I sent, which I was like, okay, I should probably share this. It also has an ethnic, sexual, and gender-based dominance hierarchy bordering on a caste system, whereby the status of each of these traits is determined by the perceived traits impact on the status in the plurality of neighboring on status in the plurality of neighboring cultures. This provides differential pressure for individuals with these traits to convert and loudly proselytize the more bizarre and nonsensical elements of the monoculture. Mm -hmm. I often say that the urban monoculture loves the LGBT community in the same way Hamas loves hospitals. It sets up the most imperious elements of its operation in the hearts of vulnerable communities to divert attacks against it to those communities, allowing it to claim the moral high ground. This can be seen in its tendency to use the rainbow flag to show conquest over institutions. After a mosque, synagogue, etc., has been conquered, they will hang this out front to direct anger away from the culprit of the cultural erasure and towards the LGBT community. And I would remind listeners here again that 45% of gay men voted for Donald Trump in the last election cycle. It's like bull baiting with a red flag to get the bull to attack the wrong location. Or 
even more hilariously, they've dressed a child all up in red and let him run around the uh, ring with the bull chasing him so that they can merrily pick it off while it's distracted. Again, I need to be clear, there is no agency or plan in any of this here. These are all just culturally evolved mechanisms. The iter the iteration of the culture that did this outcompeted the ones that actually tried to protect these communities. And this is something I want to take a, 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 a quick aside on here because there isn't people are like, no, it needs to redirect the anger at the LGBT community. It needs that the LGBT community as its loudest voices. And it's like, no, it doesn't. It controls our media. It controls our school system. It could use powerful people to, to be the scapegoats, but it doesn't. It uses the vulnerable members of its community to be the scapegoats, to be the, the, the biggest proponents of the most imperious aspects of the culture and the loudest proponents. You know, when you go on TikTok and you see the craziest ultra-progressive viewpoints, they are people in these communities. They are not the, the actors who have security. They are not the politicians. They are not the ultra-wealthy tech company CEOs who take the most milk toast perspectives, which is where, where if the community was virtuous, it would be driving anger. And you say, well, no community could work that way. Well, yeah, they can. Many conservative communities, especially ultra-conservative communities, it is the leaders of those communities that take the responsibility and the burden of the social attacks against those communities and promoting and keeping the communities on a virtuous path uh, insofar as they define virtue, which means pushing some of the crazier ideas or crazier ideas insofar as craziness is defined by distance from the dominant cultural group in society or other cultural groups in society. Mm -hmm. So the urban monoculture spreads by infiltrating institutions then expelling members who have allegiance to the institution's original mission. I mentioned this in the case of the feminist movement above, but we see this phenomenon play out in companies, religions, etc. Once the mimetic infection reaches a certain stage, the institution will start building new structures designed to ensure ideological conformity, further the spread of the mimetic virus, and expel anyone who appears to show immunity. An example of these types of structures are ESG departments. The urban monoculture tells people that they have a duty to identify as whatever they feel in the moment and do whatever makes them feel best in the moment insofar that does not hurt other people. While this may seem benign as a commandment, a culture that uses this as their North Star is going to be very bad at motivating sacrifice and thus have a very low fertility rate. It is also going to have huge mental health issues, but that is beside the point. It is important to note that the urban monoculture is not just a continuation of utilitarian left-leaning ideas optimized around increasing aggregate world happiness and equality. When choosing between those goals and removing in-the-moment suffering, the urban monoculture always chooses the removal of in-the-moment suffering. For example, if you point out that being overweight is unhealthy, this could cause in the moment pain to an individual, even though it would be in their long-term best interest. So the urban monoculture suppresses it. Banning test scores in high schools obviously increases inequality by allowing rich kids to go to their extracurricular where they will still be tested. However, doing so removes in the moment negative emotions. Government programs handing out drugs on the streets obviously increase inequality, but also remove in the moment suffering. So throughout this, it's really important to note that this is not the progressive culture you grew up with. It borrowed some of those elements. And I think a lot of people who haven't been targeted yet by the urban monoculture yet don't realize how much it's changed. Yeah, I think I think that is probably the vast majority of people who still identify as progressives and then unknowingly support progressive policies is they did grow up with this more sane version and they don't realize how insane it's gotten. And I, yeah, you're probably totally spot on. Which well, is to say that we're not saying, like, it's, it's actually a very small minority that's gone off the rails, but then... But they have all the positions of power. Yes. And they have been able to utilize those positions of power to transform our society in a direction that hurts the very groups that they claim to want to protect. Mm -hmm. And you can see this in the data, as I've said. Like, and so I want to be clear here, right? Like, a lot of people, they'll come to me and they go, no, this is only the extremists who believe those things. I am a progressive and I define progressive beliefs by what I believe, right? Because I identify as a progressive. And when I say, well, those aren't really progressive beliefs anymore. Those are actually much closer to conservative beliefs today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but no one, when we say that, believes us. Yeah, they don't believe us because they haven't been targeted yet. And then I constantly see the same story playing out again and again. They see something in their company or something like that that they thought was reasonable because they hadn't had to be in a bureaucratic environment that was dominated by this new cultural group yet, you know? Well, and you um, see this with like and Locked and Reported. You see this with the free press. Mm -hmm. There is this new class of elite progressive that is now seen as like heterodox or 
even sometimes labeled by the establishment as conservative merely because they have been like, wait, no, 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 this is crazy. But they still maintain their progressive stances of the days of yore, which is to say like in what traditionally progressivism was rather than off the rails insanity that it is now, mm -hmm. right? And I think that it's it's easy to see when you're a progressive to, to, to dehumanize your enemies when you do not look for disconfirming evidence of the stuff they're telling you. It's easy to... Like a great example of this is the don't say gay bill, for example, right? Like when I point out the conservatives haven't really done that much that's really homophobic in a while. Um, they're like, what about the don't say gay bill? And I'm like, actually, I know one of the people who wrote that bill. And the number one progressive complaint that people could use that bill to get a teacher fired for being gay or telling her students that she's gay. Literally, that was in like the language when the bill was first written could have been used to do that. But the conservatives within the conservative movement read it and they said, oh, we need to take that language out so that it is only the teaching of sexuality to children, not like an individual's identity, not their home life, not them even mentioning these things to students. It's only the teaching of sexuality that we want to prevent or, or like specific sexual acts to students. And yet progressives, they don't know this. They don't believe this because it's hidden from them in their media. The, the conservative movement has significantly moderated its views on these issues. And in them using things like the LGBT community as their scapegoat constantly, the progressives using it, they are reigniting genuine animosity within the conservative party that when conservatives end up replacing them, which they will eventually, it's just demographics, is going to be very, very bad for people with those traits who we do not want to see come to harm due to the short-sightedness of these, these fraudsters that are claiming to represent them. And it is... It's really sad that it's gotten to this stage, but what I say with something like Trump, the point I was making here, is they say, you know, if you don't know that much, if you haven't really looked at his policies, if you haven't really looked at the effects that they've had on the global stage and you're just doing this, it's easy to see him as like a crazy person or a bad person or everyone who supports him as a bad person. But when you really engage with it, even claims around things like that the election might've had some issues, when you really genuinely engage with it, instead of just spout talking points, you can see how a well-meaning, intelligent person could come to that perspective. I'm not saying it's true, but I'm saying it's not insane, okay? And, and yet progressives are taught that these are insane positions. And it is going to lead well, to- Well, it's not an insane position when their candidate loses an election, but- Well, on. yeah, you know, then there was definitely some form of election temporary. But it's going to lead to them doing more and more blazingly anti-democratic things as they dehumanize their opponents. Mm. And eventually, this is going to lead to something like a civil war. If, if they keep this up, if they blazingly continue to- Brazenly. Use, uh, brazenly continue to use other families and other cultural groups to supply their population, e.g. parasitize their children using the educational system they employ, well, if you can't understand why people are existentially angry about that, and why that's going to cause problems in the long term. I, I just, I don't know how to communicate. Like we are trying to defuse a situation that is going to end with you, the progressive group suffering, because you have a low fertility rate right now. You are the group that will be the vulnerable one in the future. And we are trying to help you before things get bad. And there you have it. <laughs> anyway, I love you to death, Simone. I love you too, Malcolm. And weird times, but I'm glad I'm spending them with you. So thanks for that. I, I feel the same way. Hmm.